Hey, what's up? This is the Flyover Libertarian Podcast, where three unimportant people from an unimportant place give you the opinion that you didn't ask for. I'm Josh, a.k.a. Iowa and Cap. I am Darabelli. Welcome, everyone. And today we're talking to the editor-in-chief of the Hoppian, uh, org, dot com. which is it again? Hoppian.org. Hoppian.org. We do our uh, research here Jared, on this podcast. And, uh, we do lots of research here. Uh, so the, he's the, uh, the Hoppian editor-in-chief, uh, founder, owner, whatever, uh, general king, absolute monarch. Uh, <laughs> That's a, well, that's a great description. That's, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're, we're having you on because this is a, a, a project that a lot of my friends uh, that I've gotten to know on, on Twitter, the Twitter sphere, even some people like uh, our friend Isaac, who was on our show a while back, have gotten involved with. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that project and, and uh, hear more about, I guess, Hoppianism in general. So to start, how about you just tell us about um, the Hoppian website and what you guys do, um, how it works and all that stuff. Sure. Absolutely. So, uh, Hoppian.org is basically a contribution site. So we, uh, host staff articles, we host contributor articles, and, uh, in the future, we're looking at, uh, revamping our website and adding in some other things, including a podcast of our own, uh, and I can kind of leak that name now. The leak of that, the, the leak of that name for that podcast that we'll be doing is called No Tolerance. Um, wow, and that obviously nice. comes from the famous Hoppe quote, uh, there can be no tolerance towards Democrats yeah. and communists in a libertarian social order. So that's where, that, that's where the name comes from. We've already got an intro worked out. We just uh, have to find some time to do the recordings. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to organize schedules and come up with topics and things like that. And then we're also thinking about doing something similar to uh, Mises Wire, where uh, Mises hosts blogs and things like that. We'd like to do something uh, kind of similarly played off of that called Hopwire, kind of like Hotwire, you know, yeah. kind of play on that name. But that's something similar that we're wanting to do there. And then we generally just take on um, the kind of the left libertarian ideos- ideosphere. Um, it's become very pervasive in the. Um, in the libertarian space to be more left-leaning and be more accepting of those ideas while rejecting kind of the right side of the ideosphere. And that's kind of where the idea came from was there was a lot of co-option, right? Um, A lot of uh, pulling Murray Rothbard apart and using what people wanted out of him and not what he was, right? That misrepresentation and that really... As someone who has read a lot of Rothbard and Hoppe, that killed me when you see that and you see all of the past, um, the the defenses of Rothbard by Joe Salerno and uh, all the other guys that used to be classically on the um, the, the old right uh, side of the spectrum. They would defend these guys from the Buckleyites, right? Like these neocons and things like that and saying, no, you're not really right wing. Murray Rothbard is right winger. You don't know what you're talking about. And now you've got these guys that are over here like, they're, no, Murray Rothbard was on the left. I'm pretty sure Murray Rothbard would not have had a good day with those people. So that's, that's pretty much where it comes from, and that's what we're trying to do. I, I just don't know how the guy who wrote egalitarianism as a revolt against nature can be in any way classified as left. Oh, it, it, it's insane. And, and you'll see the, the classic argument of these people. And, you know, they go by tons of different names, left libertarians, and, and it really, kind of, it's a little unfair to call them left libertarians, because when people say left libertarian, there are some actual thinkers on the left libertarian side. That's why we, we've taken to calling these people Lulberts, because they're not really, they're not really anything. They're not ideologically consistent. They're not uh, well-read. They get all their information from blogs and things like that. And then they feed off of memes, right? Which memes are great. Don't get me wrong. I love, I love memes making myself. But uh, you can't get all your information from there, right? You still got to read. You still got to have a, a basis for things come from, where things come from. So, you know, we call them Lulberts or, um, you know, leftarians or, uh, you know, left libertarians if we're being very generous to them. And it's uh, it's hard for me to see that happen, and it, it, it's it's amazing. And the, the this argument that they use is that uh, late Rothbard was trash, but early Rothbard was great. And I go into this in one of my articles on the website, and 
the the article basically goes through the timeline of, of Rothbard's history, right? And Rothbard says repeatedly throughout all of his works, is he says, I'm not a left winger. You know, I've always been a right winger. I've all, you know, from when I was young until I got old, I was always a right winger. And it, it amazes me that people can say that early Rothbard was good and late Rothbard was bad. When Rothbard was the same across that entire spectrum, he grew and learned more. His misadventures with uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, I don't know if you guys are aware of that incident, but uh, that helps Rothbard grow quite a bit, right? And that to ignore those types of events in a man's life and say that he got dumber as he got older and not wiser really rubs me the wrong way. And then, of course, uh, you know, and I'm really defending Murray Rothbard here, and the site's called Hoppian.org. But, you know, Hoppe is uh, the, uh, he, he is the successor to Murray Rothbard. Regardless of what anyone says, Hoppe is the successor to Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard would have told you that. Um, Murray Rothbard praised Hoppe all the time, calling people that hated Hoppe Hoppophobes, right? Like they they couldn't they couldn't deal with this brash six uh, four German uh, coming in and the, you know immediately what is everybody going to do with a six four German right they're going to call him a Nazi that's the very first thing they're going to do and and it's insane because Hoppe is obviously not a Nazi he'll listen to anybody he'll talk about anything but he's obviously not a Nazi he's obviously not a communist I mean he grew up in East Germany, right? Um, he studied under leftists and uh, communists and, and came to this realization by himself. But Hoppe is like the, the harder one to, uh, or the easier one to pull away from that left sphere because he's so outspoken, while Murray Rothbard had that ingrained knowledge, right? And, and you have to untwine him from that, 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 uh, that left-wing narrative. But anyway, I've been yeah. speaking for too long, so go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I think you've got that. Um, I think in some ways it's a victory that we no longer have to defend Rothbard, right? Like, we, we don't have to actually say, no, 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 we have to, we have to read Rothbard. Um, it seems like that was kind of the really the early battle is to get the libertarians to be like, no, we, all, we are all the children of Rothbard. But now the problem is now that they've accepted Rothbard, it's like they're trying to turn him into them. Like, uh, I, I think about uh, my, my world is, is the church, and I think about, like, the old, uh, the old uh, liberals in, in, in the liberal sen- in sense of the uh, liberal Christianity and uh, this historical Jesus project where they, it says they looked into the deep well of the historical Jesus and they saw their own reflection. It's kind of like that's what they're trying to do now is they're looking at Rothbard and just trying to see their own reflection um, when, you know, he's, he had his own ideas. 100%. Yeah, and, and, and you can yeah. see that in a, in a vast majority of um, scholarly works, right? You get a lot of people in there that, that will look at a philosopher and they'll try and make them into something they're not because that validates them, right? If I can see this in this great man who, who everybody loves and I admire, if I can see myself in that man, then I have been validated, right? And that's just not the way it is. That's not a fact. And people have to get over that. And that, those people are the genuine people, right? And then mm-hmm. you have the other people that are just totally disingenuous on the other side. Right. But absolutely, get your point. Yeah. And so I, I think, uh, so uh, what would you say is kind of, the definition or what, what are the, the common characteristics of these lullbirds? And I, I, I use that terminology myself as maybe you've seen uh, on Twitter myself. Um, but what, what would you say are the common characteristics or if there is an ideology, what would it be? So I, I, I would uh, probably class, classify them as a, a loose band of uh, progressives. Um, that is probably the most vague uh, generalization I can make about them. They're definitely never on the right, right? They're always on the left. From what I see, they're always on the left. They're always people that are involved in um, these group chats or uh, organizations that are non-serious. Um, there's several of the quote-unquote loser brigade I could quote, but I don't want to give them attention, so I won't. Um, very yep. harsh on how our own people when they address those guys. Um, just don't talk to them. They're not worth it. They're not serious. Um, they haven't read what they need to read, so don't even address them. So I'm not going to give them the, uh, the mention. But um, th- that, that kind of loose progressive association, the, the, lack of not, the lack of being 
uh, educated in the sphere, um, with the ability to understand the, the entire history of not only Austrian economics, but libertarianism itself, right? And then there's these people that will um, be completely disingenuous with not only the history of libertarianism, but the history of how it applies to the state, right? Um, you'll, you'll have people like the bake-the-cake libertarians, right? These people are lowers, right? You, you can't get around this. You, you can't force an independent uh, person to sit there and make what you want to make just because you don't like what they're doing. If I want to kick you out of my business because you're a certain color or a certain religion or a certain, uh, uh, I don't know, you have a certain hairstyle I don't like, I'll kick you out. That's, that's what libertarian is, right? It's, it's private property rights. And if you don't understand that and you try and make it more than that, then you've become a low work pretty much. So hopefully that that's, it's not an exact definition, but it's a, it's a generalization that I can make to hopefully convey that message to your audience. Yeah. I, yeah. And that's, I would say that there's a lot of what I would define a low bird as too. like for, for me, I, I, what I love about it and it, uh, is that it, you know, it starts with LOL, laugh out loud, you know, they're lulbers, like they're unserious. It's, it's not someone to be taken seriously intellectually. Um, 100%. Yeah, when I think of them, like, yes, they are leftists, but leftists insofar as kind of just established society is leftist. You know, it's, it's not... 100%. Yeah, it's, it's not an intellectual leftism, like they're trying really hard to follow leftist ideology. They're just, and, and this is really what, What's so funny about them is they are unserious in their thinking, and yet they want to convince everyone that they're the serious people in the room. Like, they're the ones chasing respectability, and they're the ones who want the Libertarian Party to be another respectable party like the, the R's and the D's, and they want Libertarians just to have a seat at the table. You know, just let her debate. And, uh, right, right. and yet they yeah. don't have any philosophical underpinning, you know? None. And, and yeah, know, I, I love I love watching these guys, and, and this is something I really like. Smith, that, you know, I've been critical of Dave Smith in the past, um, just because of uh, he was kind of in that early stage where he was latching on to a lot of um, like common arguments that you see in the lower sphere that you know, like oh, taxation is theft and stuff like that. And, you know, you're trying to get him more. And, and there was a ton of really good people who were really trying their best to make sure that Dave got up to speed, right? And he has. He's done a lot of reading, and I give him a lot of, super lot of credit because a lot of people won't take that step. And you got to give the man credit for that, and I absolutely do. And it's so hilarious to me to watch Dave take on these guys that are just totally not well-read. And, and Dave, and no offense to Dave at all, but he's not the most well-read person either, right? Right. Like, it's to see Dave totally crush these guys totally shows what they are. And to, to think that one of these guys could get on stage with Joe Salerno or Mark Thornton or, um, uh, you know... Uh, Jeff Dice. Huelsman, yeah, Jeff Dice, uh, Tho Bishop, uh, George Pickering, any of these guys. Like, it, like you, there's no, absolutely no way that they could stand up to that kind of heat. And it makes it that that gives me some validation myself, right? Because it's yeah. like you know I've been fighting this battle for years, and to see that to see that happen is just great. So I give Dave a lot of credit for that. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you know on that point of him not being super well read, like I think he's you know it's that's part of his whole shtick, right? He's like, yeah, I I know I'm not the smartest guy out there. I just you know I'm the guy with the superpower that I have this libertarian philosophy, and and you know he. And I think that's one of the things that he even will so talk about too, right? Like if I can take these guys, it shows really how unserious they are. And yeah, exactly. and, I and I think that's where like a lot of these guys will have to hide behind um, their respectability and say, you know, like we're, we're above this. We don't need to be digging in the dirt with these hoppy and types like we we're we're the serious <laughs> people, you know, and they have to do that because, you know, they can't handle a debate with an actual serious thinker. And I'm not even saying I'm that guy. I'm just saying like I, the people who I follow, like I just, I just know they couldn't handle it. And um, yeah, I, yeah. so yeah, go on, go ahead. No, uh, I was go just going to say, you know, and, and I, w I wouldn't classify myself as a serious thinker either. I, I mean, I've read a lot of books. I've been in this sphere for a long time. I've seen my own evolution, right? Um, you know, when I was, 
I was back in the Ron Paul revolution era, right? Like who wasn't, that is a, that is a libertarian today. That wasn't one before Ron Paul, right? If you were in this sphere and you're, you know, around your thirties or earlier, a little later, you're pretty much were converted by Ron Paul, right? Like that, that is, um, that's who you are. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the most, uh, I'm not the most intelligent person. Won't be the first person to tell you I'm I'm the most brilliant guy in the room. I know when I'm outclassed, uh, like debating Jeff Dice would scare the crap out of me, right? Like, uh, but I do think I could hold a good conversation with him, and that's that's I think is the mark of someone that can um, that that can rep- represent the, the idea as well. Dave Smith has that, right? He can hold yeah. that conversation. He won't sit there and. Um, he won't, he won't pander to any groups. He he just lays it on the table and he tells these guys what it is and he uses what classically they try to use against others, right? Like you're not a real libertarian, right? And Dave won't say that to these guys, but that's the conveyed message, right? Is you're not a real libertarian because you're not serious and you don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah. I think there's there's something to uh I remember hearing Jeff Dice on who you know, he's one of my favorite thinkers. Um and he uh he was on Tom Woods' podcast and he was talking to him about how like just the best libertarians are all start from an econ- a place of economics. Like there is just and that's just kind of a commonality. Like they they first come to this economic or they start in the economic sphere, then they work out into others. And I think that's a, that was a really interesting insight and I wished that he had gone further into why. <laughs> like do do you share yeah. that common that, that I, idea, know, I, I I can see that thread in a lot of people, so I can see why he would think that. Um, if you look at even, yeah, well, I mean, if you look at everyone that is a great thinker in the libertarian sphere, that's where they started, right? So I can see why he would say that. I don't know if that's where my uh, beginning started. I think mine was more uh, over gun rights. Um, oh, that's yeah. where kind of like I've always been. That's been my that's been my sphere. Um, not to say that I've not been interested in economics. I mean, the I don't know if you guys have ever read it, but the Creature from Jekyll Island really got me started. Um, I read that book, and then um, I went online. I think uh, I can't even remember 2007 and uh, 2006, 2007, and I started reading, and then I found Lou Rockwell's blog, and I, I, it exploded from there, and then Ron Paul came on the scene, and I was immediately on board with Ron Paul, and it, uh, it all went from there. I, I know that there are some people that, you know, come from all over, um, you know, it's people that were former communists, people that were uh, hardcore right-wing fascists, you know, it, even some guys that I know that were neo-Nazis, and they came to this thing through Ron Paul because Ron Paul was very popular even in those spheres right and it, they they came over and they were like this all makes sense like this yeah. you you can't deny it. it there is a logical proof here of yeah. how things work and then the libertarian ideology explains the economics right like mm-hmm. it it is the um or maybe it's the opposite and I'm sure Jeff Dice could tell me but um it, it's one or the other right it one explains the other and, and one determines the other so um, that is, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can't see, I can't really see anybody not understanding the, um, the, the premise behind all of this once they understand the economics, right? Um, if you understand right. the economics, that, that pretty much gets you there, but I'm not, yeah. but I'm not a hundred percent sure that I would say that that's where the be right. all and right. all is. Sure. Yeah. And I, and I wonder if it, it had more to do with like the. The, the fact you know like what we've been talking about is that the the intellectual seriousness and people who get into libertarianism via economics or after they've gotten to libertarianism dig into the austrian economics that it gives this this philosophical framework that the whole thing sits better on instead of becoming just a a meme or just honestly like just someone with daddy issues uh and I, <laughs> yeah. you know oh my that's exact and that was a that was a brilliant quote. I really love that quote that uh, about that. But yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm kind of old. I, I'm not old. I'm you know, I'm only in my 30s, but I, I'm I'm old in this sphere, right? Like, I don't know. Were you guys around during the the Ron Paul Revolution? Um, no, I I actually um was, and I I actually say this in our first episode. Uh, I was on Team Giuliani in the. Oh no. Ron Paul moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was 
I was watching that debate live and I was like, yeah, Ron, apologize. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but, was, you know, well, yeah. but now look, look at where you are, right? I mean, yeah, it, right? it's amazing. That, 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 I, I love that old man to death. I hope I get the chance to meet him one day. But uh, yeah. he really did change my life in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, that, that kind of... That, that kind of, that kind of mo- moment happens for so many people. And I, you know, I was around, like I was saying in the early days of kind of the Ron Paul revolution. And there was this website called the daily Paul. And I, I hope I don't get castrated for this because talking about the daily Paul is kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a faux pas because of everything that went on on that website. But you huh. had, um, back then it was, it was basically the one-stop shop for libertarianism and Ron Paul, right? The daily Paul. Lots of people went there. I went there all the time. Lots of good people there. And, and there was a, a mix. There was a mix of probably 60% right-wingers and uh, 40% left-wingers. Um, and the owner-operator of the site was more obviously on the left, right? Huh. Um, the, the owner-operator of the Daily Poll uh, was getting an immense amount of traffic. I mean, an immense amount of traffic. He was getting people to come on there. Paul Ryan said he checked the Daily Paul every day. Um, there, there were big name senators, big name representatives, big name donors that were checking this website. Right, like this was a serious, serious deal. And they ended up shutting it down. And the reason that they shut it down was because of the ideological differences between the left and the right. And they couldn't go on without purging people and violating the, this idea in their head that they couldn't shut down free speech, right? Yep. Which, is we, which is we all know, if you're a Rothbardian, you don't believe in free speech. Free right. speech is, uh, is a construction of private property, right? Right. So, so anyway, um, the, the reason that the, the left grew so much after that incident, and I, I don't want to mean to get into a giant history lesson here, but the reason that the left grew so much after that was because the Daily Paul gave them a voice, right? And that kind of reignited the whole SDS uh, fiasco kind of in my mind. Like it was the second coming of the SDS fiasco where you had the, these, these left-wingers coming back into the libertarian moment and, uh, and dividing us. And uh, I don't know, I can go into that as well if you guys want, but that had originally happened to Rothbard as well. He realized that, wow, you cannot, you cannot deal with these people. They, right. are, uh, the, are, they are the representation of Robert Conquest's third law, right? Like any, any, um, any group that is not explicitly right wing will eventually become left wing because it will yes. be subverted, right? So, um, oh my gosh, it's see. so true. Yeah, it is, and, and this is the, that's what had originally happened to the libertarian moment back in, back in the day. Um, and then when Rothbard went on to create the Libertarian Party, it happened again. And Rothbard at that point was like, this is what happens. This is what happens when you try and be open to the left, is they're parasitic, right? And, and, that, yeah. I'm not, I'm, and, I'm not, and I'm not downing any leftists. If you're listening to this and you're a left-winger, I'm not downing you. This is just the nature of left-wing thought, is that it is parasitic. It will invade right-wing spaces and, and slowly convert and change them until they're no longer right-wing spaces. It's just the way yeah. it works. You can see this happen in conservatism. Conservatism, this happened with the neocons yes. and the Trotskyists, right? Yep. They came in, they converted them. This happened with the YAF and SDS disaster with Murray yep. Rothbard, and then it happened with the early Libertarian Party, which is why Murray Rothbard ended up leaving the Libertarian Party and saying, you guys have got an egalitarian problem. You have a serious egalitarian problem, and I'm not going to be associated with this anymore. I'm out. Yeah. Cato so, Institute? Cato Institute, that's yep. another perfect, perfect in, uh, example. Yeah. Um, if you're not explicitly right wing, you will become left wing. Yeah. And that's what, uh, that, that's really what the Hoppian's all about, you know, is saying we're not left wing and we're not going to apologize for it, right? So, yeah. I, I actually tweeted about this the other day, and it's because I, I live in kind of two worlds. You know, I've talked a lot about how I, I live in the libertarian world, and that's mostly what this is all about. But um, I also live in the church world, and, um, Especially like the among the reformed uh, theological people is where I, where I kind of found my home. And one thing that I've noticed is like, and I actually tweeted about this the other day, like we keep like conservatives keep doing this thing where we start an institution, we lose the institution, we leave the institution, start a new institution, and then we lose that institution. 
and it's it's just this constant re- and it's like it's, it's reaction yeah. it's reactionary in like the worst sense of the word in the Absolutely. in the sense of we're just there's no uh we, like no one starts no with solution. like asking the question yeah they're, they're, no one's asking the question so how does the how does the degeneracy happen how does it right. keep happening you know yeah and this is this is um part of why i advocate gatekeeping gatekeeping and quote unquote borders is such an important thing because if you don't protect your private property, you don't protect your own space, it will get taken over and it will become a tragedy of the commons. This is yeah. an economic principle, right? Like you cannot allow just anybody on there and who's the best person to decide who comes on and off your property. Of course that's you because you're going to take the best care of it. And somebody else that comes on and is not going to take good care of it, right? Because they yeah. don't care. They don't have to pay the, the whatever to maintain it and so on and so forth. Right. And this is, I, and I'm, I, and I have no idea what, uh, what denomination you guys are of Christianity, Christianity, but you can really see this in Catholics. Um, yeah. I think in Catholic spaces, you can really see it and it's become very evident that there are, that the the this parasitic nature has latched on to churches, and then you have um, uh, charities that go the same way. And I really think, and this will, I'm sure, will piss off some Catholics, um, but I think that it really started in the charity space. Um, mm. They a lot of the Catholic charities um, started needing more and more people to do this because of, you know, the, obviously the welfare state started pushing down on the charities, right? So the charities needed more workers, they needed more volunteers, and the best place to get those people, unfortunately, is often in left-wing spaces because these guys want yeah. to do stuff like that, right? And that's so sad to me, it really yeah. is. And I think that that's where it started. Um, and then it spread from there. It spread to the tr- it spread to the local churches, and then it spread further than that. And I think it's spread all the way through. Um, yeah, a lot of Catholics will probably hate me for saying that, and I apologize if I've offended any Catholics. But um, I think that if you take a hard look at, at the Catholic Church, that you might agree that the same thing has happened. But that's yeah. just one example, right? There's so many examples in history that go beyond even libertarianism and religion. Yeah. Um, governments. Um, <laughs> entire ethnic groups. Um, mm-hmm. it, it happens everywhere, and it's such a pervasive theme throughout history that it amazes me nobody's written a book on it yet. Like it, it, it destroys me that nobody's taken the opportunity to look at this common thread and say, "Hey, maybe we've got a problem here. Maybe we should be better gatekeepers and better uh, yeah. protectors of our institutions." You know? Yeah, and and it's and it seems like there's there's even this problem of like. There, there is an assumption that we come to that I think is not entirely fair. That we assume that people who use our language are with us, you know, yeah. like. But whereas, what the reality is, like what you said, is that what the what does the left do? They take the language, and they make it mean something different. And so now justice doesn't mean justice. Now, right, you know, liberty doesn't mean liberty it doesn't mean you know doesn't mean property rights it doesn't mean non-aggression principle it means the freedom to you know essentially to be a leftist but not to be anything else you know like they they'll eventually take these concepts and kind of twist them and um yeah yeah you just see it all over the place and and a hundred percent and yeah it, i i wrote an article about this actually a little while back um a few years ago Back when I had an older site, um, and I the the title of the article was etymological terrorism, because that's kind of what it is, right? Like you're 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 taking words and changing them to facilitate your political change, right? And that's really what people have done. They did that with the word racist. Obviously, yep. that's one of the most obvious ones that I can think of. Um, they've done it with libertarian. Did you know? Hey, how many times have you been on Twitter or on a message board and say, "Hey, did you know libertarian was actually a left wing socialist from France?" And and you know, which is just a flat out lie. It, it's it's just a flat out lie, and I can prove that if any uh, liber- quote unquote libertarian socialists want to know, you can look up William Belsham. He was the first one to use libertarianism as a word in that sense, and he was. Uh, he was a determinist, and he thought that uh, the people that believed in free will were idiots, and he used the word libertarian as a derogatory term for people who believed in free will. So 
Uh, and then the uh, the Joseph DeJoc and all of those guys appropriated that for their politics. Um, mm-hmm. It was never used in a philosophical sense. Again, it's, it, at the very least, in, until the United States, um, when uh, Albert J. Nock and uh, Mencken picked it up and began to use it. So yeah. th- that that's just one example, right? Uh, uh, the, the very word that we, we take very seriously or have taken seriously uh which is libertarianism if you think about that just as a microcosm what else has changed you know that's that's when it gets really scary is when you start to think about all the things that they've changed over time if they can change that one word that defines an entire philosophy what else can they change so this is called the hopian the the website is the hopian um so what if you could explain or define hopianism um what would you explain it, or how would you define it? So, um, first and foremost, uh, you, you have to believe in some of the, the basic principles that Hans Hermann Hoppe lays out, right? Which is obviously private property. Um, there are obvious differences between him and even really good libertarian thinkers, specifically on borders. Um, that's just one example. Um, I, and I can go into that and give you a better explanation of what I mean on that, but you can call me a bordertarian. That isn't going to bother me. Um, yes, I'm a bordertarian. Sorry. Um, that's who I am. The, the next thing is obviously argumentation ethics. Um, if you don't accept that, you don't understand Hoppe at all. Um, the reason for that is uh, it is a fundamental philosophical bridge, right? And I use the term bridge a little ironically because of the Azot gap. Um, some some people will get that, that joke and nerdy esoteric stuff. But anyway, um, so you have to believe in argumentation ethics because it it, it does bridge that gap, um, in philosophy, so you can understand really where Hoppe is coming from and how you can justify, um, the uh, nature of non-aggression itself, right? Um. I, I'm working on my own theory and that I've been working on for a couple of years, um, writing my own book of how um, this all breaks down, but that's kind of irrelevant to your question. Um, but anyway, that you have to believe in that. You have to believe in non-aggression, obviously. Um, and you, uh, you have to be a capitalist, right? Um, regardless of how um, that term, again, you know, etymology changes, you have to believe in the, the free exchange. I don't, I'm not one of these people that believes in the term freed markets. I'm not that guy. I'm a capitalist, right? I believe in capital, believe in the exchange of capital. I believe in the use of capital goods to, to build industry and build, um, b- build out personal fortunes and all of that. I'm not, a, uh, uh, I'm not this freed market. I'm not an agorist. Um, I really don't believe you can be an agorist and a hopian at the same time. Um, some people might find that shocking, but I can tell you why. Um, and I, and in general, you have to have a, 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 a paleo libertarian mindset in my, in my view to be a hobby and right. Um, and people can read Lou Rockwell's article about paleo libertarianism, but, uh, beyond that, I, I think Hoppe would say, uh, if you're a hobby and you're a Rothbardian, right. Uh, and I think you're a Rothbardian taken to its logical conclusion, which is a hobby. Um, sure. so uh, hopefully that gives you some kind of sense of, of what a hopian is, and hopefully it gives that your audience that same sense. Yeah. Um, but if you really want to know more, check out hopian.org and you can find out. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, there's a few things I heard you talking about that were really good. You know, capital, capitalism, um, yeah. Um, Rothbardianism, which is not aggression principle. Pr- private property is absolutism. Um, uh, you know, self-ownership, private property non-aggression you know that's really how i I guess i understand rothbardianism um explain really quickly what you mean by paleo libertarian because that's a term that gets thrown out a lot um but i don't know that everyone fully understands that so um back in the day uh lou rockwell wrote an article called paleo libertarianism um and he, in that, laid out basically what we were talking about earlier, which is there was a definite problem in the libertarian audio sphere. It was invaded by the left. They saw it, um, you know, crumbling, right? So they were like, we've got to break away. We've got to create new, forge new alliances, and we've got to figure out our own path forward here. So um, there was originally a paleo uh, alliance between paleo libertarians 
which Lou Rockwell uh, lined out, and I can give you guys the highlights of that in a second, and then paleoconservatives. Um, Hoppa, believe, Hoppa and Rothbard believe that uh, if the paleocons could come our way uh, and we could go their way on certain things, then we could come together and create a real alliance that could really be a threat to the left. And I think that right now, today, is the second best moment in history for that to come back. And I have a feeling that we're going to see something like that happen sooner than later. Yeah. Um, there are uh, Hoppe also tried to do this with um, with the alt right. Uh, Hoppe tried to lay out for them, hey, you guys are expressing the same things that I've been expressing for a long time. That there is absolutely a problem with our culture. There's absolutely a problem with um, with our perception of reality. But here's the thing that you guys got to come back to us on, which is capitalism and markets. Right? If you can't come back to us on that then we can't join together, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that I've found more often than not that I can get a fascist to come our way on capitalism much more than I can get a communist to come our way on capitalism, right? Um, And then also on culture, right? So uh, the... Let me see here. The... uh, Okay, I don't think I have it here, but I thought I had it on this page. Maybe I did. The case for paleo-libertarianism. Um, and I can uh, give you guys a link to that. We, we, uh, we're hosting it on our website as well. Um, but anyway, uh, Lou Rockwell wrote a very long article. Um, not very long. I guess it's uh, four or five pages uh, detailing out um, what paleo-libertarianism is. He uh, basically lays out that, you know, uh, paleo-libertarians are libertarians. Uh, they just took the word from us and we're rebranding. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you uh, believe in conservative culture, you believe in Christian ethics, you believe in Christianity uh, that laid the foundation. You don't even have to be a Christian. You just have to believe in Christian ethics, right? That foundational piece of of Western culture and identity that is Christianity, if you believe in that, then that makes you a paleo-libertarian as well, right? So that's a piece of it. Um, How to, uh, you know, the role of the family, the role of Western culture, how important it is. Um, not even the nuclear family, but the extended family as well, right? Like, that is, uh, that is who we are, and if you don't believe that, if you believe in, you know, like, single motherhood and only fans and all of that, then you're not a paleo-libertarian, right? And you don't even, I, I, I hate the word social conservative, because it has such negative connotations hooked to it. Because um, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of social conser- social conservatism is Rick Santorum, and Rick Santorum is not Oof. a social conservative in my mind, right? Like at least I wouldn't describe him as a paleocon, right? Yeah. So I, I don't like that term, but that that's kind of what it is. It's, it's social conservatism, the rejection of egalitarianism, yeah. Uh, the embrace the the embracing of hierarchy and how hierarchy is a fundamental piece of libertarianism, and without it. You can't have libertarianism yeah. because e- economics-wise, capitalism is hierarchy, right? The yeah. corporate structure is hierarchy. The, uh, the imbalance of trade uh, is hierarchy. Without that, then you don't have capitalism. You don't have markets. Yeah. Um, the rejection of this idea that we have to allow crime in our neighborhoods, this idea that we have to um, please criminals and and rehabilitate them and all that we don't if you violate private property and harm other people people are going to harm you and you deserve it right like you do we're we're not soft on things like that we're very hard and against those things but yeah hopefully that that's a that's a good uh general overview i'm sure lou rockwell if he ever listens to this is cringing right now at my description but um but yeah, if, that's that's the way I view it. If Lou Rockwell listens to this episode, I might just quit podcasting. I, I can't <laughs> handle that kind of pressure. You made it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that's good. I I think um, you know, I've been I've been on with the paleo strategy since the beginning. I I my my journey to libertarianism. Uh, like I said, I was not. It was much later than most people do. I like to tell this because it's really funny. Um, I ironically got to libertarianism through uh. Mark Stein, his book, uh, Liberty and Tyranny, a Conservative Manifesto. Really? I don't know if I've read that book. I was Can neocon get... to the hilt back then. Oh, and okay, okay, okay. I read this book, and they labeled three types of conservative. And that's where I first learned the word, ant, uh, were, learned the word statism, too. Mm. And he described neocons, 
uh, I don't know how he would have defined this, but neocon conservatives, traditional conservatives, um, and libertarians is the three types of right, which mm-hmm. I guess I've heard that from other places too. I don't know if he used exactly those words, but it's essentially what he came to. And then he described libertarian as a type, and I was like, oh, I'm interested in that. And he directed uh, his readers to Cato Institute and Reason. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, and I, I followed that for a little while, um, but then I kind of like started, started seeing tensions that I just could not deal with between me and them. Uh, and then I kind, of, I kind of left politics entirely. I, 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 call it a, I call it my political fast while I was going through seminary. Um, I just wanted to focus on the Bible and theology and figure out what I thought about that and come back to politics. And when I came out, I first started looking at conservatism because I was like, well, that's what I was, broadly speaking, before I came out of this. And I, I started um, also, I, I, f- I ran into some people who called themselves libertarians. And I was like, oh, I started to look into that a little bit. I'd love to hear more about this. Um, but this time I came out and I, I ran into the good ones right away. It was uh, oh, that's, me- that's good. Mises types and Ron Paul types, and they were all about the paleo strategy. So I've been in on that in a while. I wonder if you could very quickly, I've been keeping you for a long time, I know, but... Uh, no, I'm fine to keep going as long as you guys want to. Okay, cool. I wonder if you could explain to me argumentation ethics, because that is, is my hang-up right now. I'm, I'm not sure I understand it. Maybe I had a wrong understanding of it. Um... So if you could just ex- like explain that to me like I'm a sixth grader. <laughs> okay, so um, let, let's say I want to fight you, right? Mm-hmm. I'm very mad at you. I'm extremely, I'm extremely pissed off. Yeah, this podcast has say, taken a very bad turn. <laughs> yeah, Josh is, <laughs> Josh is not yeah, making so, it out. So it's, yeah. <laughs> so so we're 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 going at it, right? We're at each other's throats. And and uh you say, "Hold on, you don't want to do that because." And I'm sure somebody's going to geek me on this because this is I'm sure this is a terrible explanation the way I'm doing this, but um and, and I say, "Uh okay, w- w- what do you want to say?" The moment that I accept that your argument is an argument, to be made and I don't commit an act of violence, I then presuppose the nature that you have a right to not be aggressed against because mm-hmm. that argument is there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because we have that ability to have dialogue. You've presupposed that ability to, to have that discussion. Um, the, now, there are... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of an easier way to explain the rest of it. Um, but essentially, uh, but essentially that that's pretty much it. Um, I would highly recommend that people, if you really want to understand argumentation ethics, uh, Steve, Stephen Kinsella uh, has weight. written, yes, Heavyweight has written a brilliant summary of it, and he does a much better job than I'm doing. Um, if I had some time to prep and write an article, I'm sure I could make it much simpler, much easier to understand, but that's pretty much it. If you're presupposing argument, um, if I could reduce it to one sentence, if you're presupposing argument and you're not committing violence, then you obviously don't have to because you assume my right to not be aggressed against because you stopped, right? Sure. So that that's pretty much where it's coming from. Um, I, I really don't think I'm doing it justice, but um, that's, that's pretty much what it is, is the idea that you are, um, the di- the idea that you're engaging in debate presupposes the nature of nonviolence, or not nonviolence, I'm sorry, non-aggression. Very distinct sure. difference there uh, for people that aren't aware. Nonviolence mm-hmm. and non-aggression are definitely way different. Right, um, right. So, but yeah, that that's pretty much it. Um, and it, and if you, um, so the, the whole performative contradiction thing, right? So uh, if you're not familiar with the hoposphere, uh, it, you know, the performative contradiction thing is a kind of a meme uh, where, that people use. So uh, it, Hoppe basically states that since, you know, both uh, me and you are uh, act, uh, act on propositions in the course of argument, right? Like we're, uh, we're debating back and forth. Uh, because we're presupposing that certain norms exist, um, the the norm of argument itself 
then if you act on those urges to commit violence, then you are performing what is essentially a performative contradiction, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're acting against your own um, uh, higher reasoning. Mm-hmm. I'm really doing a terrible job at this. No, it's <laughs> great. It's great. I, I, maybe, maybe we'll have to, I'll have to have a, I'll, I'll have to take a deep dive myself um, on, on the subject. I, I remember I, uh, what, what re kind of jogged my, my thinking on this, I was reading actually C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and uh, you find early in the book, one of his early arguments is this concept that we all fundamentally believe this, what he calls the natural, and what really was what the, all the old theologians called the natural law, which um, we could call God's moral law, which is that this concept of, of he even calls it like the, the law of fair play. That right. you may say that morality is relative, but when I stick out my foot and intentionally trip you, um, then suddenly you don't believe that anymore. You right. know, uh, or or as uh, one of my favorite theologians, uh, R.C. Sproul, he said he was asked the question, "How do you talk to someone who believes in, or how do you convince someone who believes in moral relativism that morality is objective?" He said, "Steal their wallet." You know, like, huh. yeah. like that's, wow, yeah. that's how you prove that they actually believe in morality. But he, he even brought up like, you know, just the very fact that we argue by nature, that means we are uh, essentially uh, referring back to a common standard. Otherwise, what are we arguing about? Right. And this is what Hoppe is getting into, right? Because he basically is saying, hey, you're making an argument. Therefore, you're presupposing that you own yourself, right? Yeah. Because if you don't own yourself, you can't make an argument, right? Then why bother? If you don't, yeah, who, 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 you can't make an argument if you don't own yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Be, and as a result of that, you presuppose that since you have self ownership, that the other person does, right? Yeah. And therefore, you can't aggress upon them because they clearly own themselves, and that would be an act of aggression against another person. That, you know, unless you deny reality, right? Unless Mm -hmm. you think that you are the only, unless you think that you are the center of the universe and everything else is a simulation, if you presuppose that you, when you argue that you are a human being and you own yourself, then you can't logically aggress against another person. Maybe that's a better way of explaining it. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, yeah, I think that's a good good way of of explaining it. Um, And and I think maybe like there's almost so like, also like um a sense in which the moral relativism that you find on the left is in many ways just another attack on uh pr- private property rights you know yeah, like it, it's it's, it's an if attack we can, on objective reality right yeah i mean if it, i can it, prove it, that your thoughts are not your own that you are just you know it's all perspective there's no objective reality there is no argumentation there is no uh Common, that's a real, you know, yeah, that's a brilliant from. way to put it. Uh, that the inherent nature of the left and their subjectivity, with in regards to to moral foundations, is a clear rejection of argumentation ethics, and therefore they are clearly rejecting the fact that you own yourself. And then, therefore, if they reject the fact that you own yourself, they rege- can reject private property, right? And that yeah. is that. That's a really brilliant thought. I like that a lot. Maybe I'll yeah. use that in an article, and, and I won't cite you. Steal away. <laughs> Intellectual property is a lie. Uh, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've been keeping you for a while. Is there anything else that you want to maybe talk about about Hoppianism, uh, the Hoppian website, um, any of the other work that you do and thought and thinking that you go into? Um, no, I I think we covered a good uh, good section here. I would definitely encourage people to go check out Hoppian.org if you haven't. Um, you can find us on um, uh, hopping.org and on Twitter. I'm on at, at in democracy. But uh, one thing that uh, that does pop out to me um, in regards to the current situation right now is secession. If you're not a secessionist right now, you need to be. Uh, you need to be advocating for it in every way, shape, and form. If you're a libertarian, I don't care if you're a left libertarian, a right libertarian, a centrist. I don't. I don't care what you are. If you believe in freedom and liberty, you need to be advocating for secession right now. Uh, hashtag national divorce because that's who we are, 
And if you don't believe in that, I really don't think you're a libertarian and you should probably be quiet. <laughs> yeah, I don't see how you can possibly look at the world as it is today and say we need to stay together for the kids. You know, it's, like yeah. it's it's insane. It is. <laughs> It's it's a dis, it's a disgusting unionism, and I you know I'm I'm a southerner right, so I, you probably can't tell from my voice because I've trained myself out of that accent <laughs> stupidly when I was younger. But um, you know I grew up in Appalachia, so self hating uh, southerner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that you would be surprised that the number of people that uh, that they have been culturally trained out of loving you know who they uh. are. It's kind of a sad reality, but that's another topic that we can go into <laughs> yeah. some some other time. But but yeah, you know, as a southerner, I totally believe in secessionism and things like that. But it, it, I really don't see how you can be um, a unionist in this day and age or ever, right? Yeah. Especially if you're a libertarian, you believe in decentralization. I hope that's not just a word for people. It is mm -hmm. the active belief in separation. And if you don't, if you're not a separatist, if you're not a decentralist, if you're not a secessionist, those are three words all mean the same thing to me. If you're not one of those, then I don't know what you're doing, but you're not doing libertarianism. Right. Yeah. I have two questions. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to actually participate tonight. Um, okay. So Jared, uh, for, um, for people who are learning, which, you know, hypothetically might be me, um, actually three questions. What are the best resources for those people? And then the second one is, what can they do? And so I'm really good at sitting on my couch and reading and learning, but um, to actually have any effect, what can be done? Oh man, this, that second conversation is going to get me in trouble. Well, let's address the first one. Um, if you want to learn, go to Mises.org. Um, go to Mises.org, find, find a copy online of a PDF of the Rothbard Rockwell report, go through those things, but wait, don't go through those things first. In my opinion, if you're going to, to read two books and you're only going to read two books, because I know people's time is limited, right? You don't have all the time in the world to read 55 books. If you're going to read two books and you're going to commit the time to reading and understanding them, you buy egalitarianism as a revolt against nature. That will give you a good foundation of what it means to be a right-wing libertarian and ultimately right-wing. There, are, and and I can, when my book comes out, if I ever get done writing it, you'll understand eventually that those two things are synonymous. If you're a right winger, you are a libertarian. If you are a libertarian, you are a right winger, and that is the fundamental nature of what it is to be right. Um, and we can talk about that some other time. But go to Mises.org, get that. Egalitarian is a revolt against nature and democracy, the God that failed. Mm -hmm. If you can understand that their hierarchy exists, it is necessary and good, and that you cannot be an egalitarian, and you understand that the democratic nature of humanity and society is, a re is essentially a revolt against its very nature and core, then you understand what it means, and you understand where you need to go from there. Um, now, if I were to add on to that, and I could, I could add on books for days, um, The uh, Economics and Ethics of Proper Pro Private Property by Hans Hermann Hamba, um, the uh, irrepressible Rothbard. If you want a good mm. laugh and you want to really see who Murray Rothbard was, buy that book. If you want to know who Murray Rothbard was, the irrepressible Rothbard is a brilliant read, and I love it. Um, now, uh, hopefully that answered your first question. Oh, and of course, visit Hoppian.org. You know, you can obviously from there, Mary. Yeah. So, um, and listen to this podcast. Uh, I own Cap here. Josh is gonna. He's definitely gonna bring on a lot of good people, and he's gonna help you get you up to speed one one hour at a time, and and get you going. But um, beyond that, to answer your second question, what can we do? Um, be an outspoken advocate of secession. Be an outspoken advocate of decentralization. Um, now, there that that is a very broad statement, right? How can I be an outspoken advocate of decentralization? Well, use social media. That you know, that's the easiest thing for people to do. Send out a tweet once a day with the hashtag secession or national divorce or something like that. It takes two seconds, and it gets other people looking and talking. Right? That's the first. That's the first thing. What else can you do? There's a big debate going on in libertarian sphere right now. Should we stick with the libertarian party? <clears throat> no. Um, or should we uh, join the Republican Party? I'm of the opinion that the Libertarian Party is gone and it has been gone for a very long time. 
Um, and the a lot of people are going to get mad at me, and they're going to say, Tom Woods and Dave Smith and all these guys are going in on the Libertarian Party. We're going to take it over, and we're going to be those guys, right? The problem with that is that there's no, there's no long-term plan. They're going to violate conquest law again. They're not going to gatekeep. They're going to try and pull as many people in as they can again, and then they're going to have that same problem again. You have to have a gatekeeping strategy if you want those types of goals to work. And they don't have that right now. Mm. And I'm sure that Dave Smith might want to have a debate with me over that. But I, I don't think that long term, even if they win, even if they were able to get in there and take control and, you know, rewrite the charter and all of that and, and really take control of the Mises Caucus and all that. Look what the Mises Caucus had to do to get where it is. They've had to kick people out. They've had to compromise. They've had to uh, silence themselves and be a little um, curbed in their attitude, right? Because if they can't, then they can't get enough people. And that's the nature of politics in that, in that realm, right? Yeah. Especially when it comes to party politics. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, you've got really good guys like Phil Bishop. Um, really love that guy. You should check out his Twitter. Um, he's a really good dude. Um, he's in the Bay Area Republicans. Um, and he's a Mises Institute guy, right? Like, mm -hmm. he's in the Bay, Bay Area Republicans in Florida. And they're making some progress. now. You can say, okay, well, what about, you know, like Amash or Rand Paul and all of this? They just compromised and they became nothing, right? I, I would disagree with that a little bit, you know, like Ron Paul. Um, Rand Paul did some, has done some good things. Um, he's taken some really principled stands on war and things like that and done a lot of good. And I think that those types of things, if you're going to do that, is really good. Here's the ultimate strategy that'll never happen in my mind is take over both. If you take over both, you can run both sides of the political spectrum. You can run libertarians and you can run Republicans and switch off, switch off states, run Republicans hard against people, all against Democrats, where that you know that they're going to win, withdraw the libertarian candidate. If the Republican candidate is not doing well, switch your strategy and reinforce the Republican with the libertarian. If you did that, mm -hmm. then the left would never win again, right? Like, that's never going to happen, but that's the ultimate strategy. Last thing, last strategic thing, focus on yourself. And I know that a lot of people will say this, and it's become a little cliche, but really focus on yourself. Become the best possible person you can be, because become the best capitalist you can be. Become the best person you can be. Yeah, have children, educate them, bring them up well, because eventually, you know, th that's going to at least prolong us. You can't, you can't outbreed the left, and, and that's a very crude way to say it, but you can't outbreed the left, but you can maintain your numbers, right? And you can, you can keep up to the point where you can at least make sure that it doesn't go extinct, right? And that's really what that strategy is about, making sure that we stay alive and we don't go extinct. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be my answer on the third piece of that. Yeah. Hopefully that, that gives you a good uh, position of where I am. And that, I would say, like, you know, I think the, when I always, when, when I get asked that question, when I think about that question of what do we do, and I, I sometimes say, well, the first thing, is like the libertarian question like what do i do i think it is a big step to just say they don't want to save you like to say that the right. state does not want to save you that is a that's a first step and i think a first step on the hoppianism uh path and and the right wing libertarian path is to first of all realize that the left wants you dead, but will settle for your submission, as Michael Malice always says. That's a that was a brilliant quote by you Michael know? Malice. It really is, and that is who they are. And once you realize that, like you suddenly get an in, you realize the nature of them. And it's funny because like I my I feel like my dad taught me that all growing up. Like like this is reality is they want you dead. And I right. would always be like, "Oh, Dad, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Like, you're not serious. I don't think people are evil. Yeah, you know? yeah. And but then there I, are there yeah. are a lot of bad people out there. Yeah. And then I went to college and met a bunch of leftists, and I'm like, No, they don't want me dead. But I've <laughs> seen their Twitter since college, and I'm like, Oh, no, they do. Yeah. They really do. <laughs> they just want to tell you that to your face, at least right. at first, right? Right. And that that's who these people are, and eventually they'll get their way. And that's why I guess if I were to add a fourth thing on there. It would be to buy guns, um, mm. buy land, uh, make sure that you can protect your family, right? Yeah. Um, make sure that you are taking the steps necessary. Um, and I know I'm going to sound like an insane prepper guy here, and I, I, I love those people, actually. They're really good people. 
um, buy guns, buy preps, store food, store water, um, because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. And uh, if you're looking at Washington today, right now, and you see what's going on, and you don't think that that looks like the third world, yeah. then maybe this ideology isn't for you because you don't understand what you're seeing. Yeah. No, 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 you don't understand. Uh, in a few days, we're going to have a new administration. We're finally not going to be ruled by a dictator. That's why they brought in <laughs> thousands yeah. of troops. That's why they yeah, brought in thousands exactly. of troops, because we'll right. finally not have a dictator anymore. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, It's frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating. It, this is literally what you see in Banana Republic. So yeah. When uh, they have an inauguration or any kind of uh, you know public event where there is a, a leader or a dictator, they surround themselves with the military and put up fences, and they don't let people in, which is why yeah. you saw, um, uh, what was his name? Not Chavez, but uh, his successor, uh, Maduro, uh, mm. try, almost got assassinated with a drone because nobody could get close to him, so they flew a drone in and tried to blow him up with a drone. Mm. Like This is the kind of stuff that you see in third world countries. Yep. And you're starting to see it here. Yep. Do you, dear America, do you not understand that we have to break up? Yep. I'm sorry. I love yep. you, but this is the end. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. Do you have any more questions, Durbelli? One more. Jared, what books are you reading right now? Oh, man. Good question. Um, so I am actually trying to get through a book called Southern Honor. It goes over uh, Southern history and Southern traditions. As a, it is, I'm reading it as a means to get back in touch kind of with my roots and who I am because I never really was exposed enough to that. I mean, I grew up in the woods, right? Like for, from the time I was 10, I was out in the woods hunting squirrels and starting fires with my friends, right? Like that, that was my childhood, right? So trying to get back in touch a little more with uh not not only with that but who I who I am and who I was that that piece of it um and then I am also uh what is the other book that I'm reading right now uh can't remember I haven't picked it up in like a week um I think I'm re I'm it's yeah, I'm rereading it what is it Oh, uh, the uh, the economics and ethics of private property by Hans Hermann Hoppe. Oh. I'm reading it again. Um, so, I uh, there are some key uh, pieces of information in there that if you want to read Hoppe and understand Hoppe, that you should definitely get that book. It will um, it will enlighten you on several things. Uh, at least it will explain things a little better than uh, some maybe some other people have tried. Um, Man, I feel like earlier with that question of what, what two books I like, I kind of want to give like the default answers, like you know, like go go read Economics in One Lesson and go read you know like The Road to Serfdom and stuff like that. Like it, you know, those are all great books, but I still think I would still stick to those two books: Egalitarianism, Revolt Against Nature, and Democracy: The God That Failed. If you're if you're serious about this and you you really want to understand what it is to be a right wing libertarian, in my mind, you can't not read those books. Make sure you check out at End Democracy and Hoppian.org for uh, more information. And we're going to have a show notes page um, with some of those articles that he mentioned um, linked there. Um, I, I would tell you what episode it is, but frankly, I don't know what it is at this point. Um, so, but, but look out for that at flyover.page slash episodes. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening.